All right, so this is essentially what we're going to be looking at for the landing gear detail. And uh, again, nothing is glued up. The wheels are just loose. The caps, wheel covers are loose. Um, the legs themselves are are loose. They're not they're not attached yet. They're just slipped on over the uh, piano wire cores. But you can see that the gear look is about right to the uh, prototype to the actual uh, P47. And what you have is a, um, you can see how the upper door is released and extended out from the lower door and that's so that when the uh, oleo compresses, the landing gear aircraft contacts the ground, the landing gear oleo shock absorber compresses and it leaves room for uh, the lower door to slide up and underneath the outer door. Um, and then for retraction, once the aircraft is off the ground and the oleo is decompressed and extended fully, the lower door um, and this whole assembly would come up and away from the upper door, allowing the upper door to seat flush with the lower door into the wheel well uh, opening. Now, I don't have all of those features. I don't have a working oleo strut. So I kind of split the difference on the extension here and then made up for it with uh, a slight overlap here and I just cut away the doubler on the inside of the uh, upper door so that this piece here would lie flush against uh, the, the lower door when, when the gear is closed, when the landing gear is retracted. Right, so um, when looking at the aircraft in landed configuration sitting on a shelf, the landing gear should look correct. Uh, if I'm hanging the aircraft from the ceiling somewhere <laughs> or posing it in flight uh, with the gear up, it'll retract flush here with a few caveats, a few areas that are not quite scale, um, but I think close enough and uh, and good enough, I hope. I hope when the project is fully realized and we're finished here with this uh, P-47 um, that it'll meet all the at least uh, elements, the elemental criteria for retractable landing gear being modeled onto this uh, static display aircraft. Again, this is static display. This is not a flyer. It's not an RC airplane. Uh, I don't build those um, anymore and really never got too far into it. I just couldn't, anyway, couldn't come up, I couldn't justify the expense of building a kit, smashing it to pieces somewhere in a field uh, within a week or two of final assembly. I just can't, I, for myself, I couldn't rationalize that. So that's why I build the static displays. So you can see here, the uh, this is the tubing that I used, eighth inch, um, oh, what's the company that makes this stuff? Uh, da, 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 the name escapes me, but it's just a one eighth inch uh, tubing, hollow tubing. So a small section of it here at the top of each of the uh, upper doors, and then it's wrapped uh, through with solder, which is then glued out, uh, glued up to the uh, leg out here, so that there's no binding in there. And then this piece, this loop here, just allows. Um, you know, it limits how far out the upper door can go while allowing the, it to come all the way down and, and flush or flat up against uh, the lower door when it, the gear is in the closed position. I figured that was the most um, simple solution uh, to what I needed the gear to do and it looks somewhat to scale. If we uh, look at the um, prototype image, I don't have to forgive the mess in here, but this is my workshop. So you can see the um, you can see here the upper retainer, which basically is what I'm talking about, um, which holds the door, keeps it from extending out too far, while still allowing it to come in and uh, and seat with the uh, lower door. Now here's the fully compressed oleos. You can see how how compressed that is. It's actually 
There's almost uh, zero travel remaining here, and this aircraft is just sitting on the ground. So as a, a, the weight of the aircraft is uh, relieved from the landing gear on takeoff, uh, the scissor strut and this oleo are extended down, and they're extended down far enough for the top of the main lower door to meet with the bottom edge of the upper door here. Again, I don't have that travel, so I split the difference on the extension and then allowed for um, the upper door to just lay flat against the, the, the upper door to lay flat against the lower door. And that was my solution. I still have to fabricate and install the inner doors, these fuselage doors or inner doors, if you want to call them that. That still has to be done. And you can see also there are a few hydraulic lines. This is just one image. I've got a few photographs. It shows some of the hydraulic uh, pressure lines. Um, they also depict the um, hydraulic gear actuator um, cylinder, which is located up in here. So there's lots of stuff to do, still to do. I'll still need to fabricate the other six guns that go onto the airplane. Um, a total of eight guns. The two I have fabricated are the landing gear lock uh, that slide it in and out, the locking barrels. Right, so. Um, this is uh, essentially the uh, the aircraft that I am modeling. Um, mine will not have removable uh, cowling or engine compartment uh, panels. It, uh, it's just again not not going for that much detail. We're we're gonna do what we can, but uh, but this is the same aircraft. Um, I think I posted a picture or two of it here and there. I'm not sure if I have any on the YouTube channel uh, pictures of this aircraft, but. And essentially, this is what we're we're going to be doing. It has a checkerboard pattern, black and white, on the cowling, and uh, it does have the uh, lower invasion stripes only. In other words, the invasion stripes don't wrap over the top of the wing, or nor do they wrap over the top of the fuselage. They're just on the undersides of the aircraft, so it has the lower uh, invasion stripes uh, only. And if you're not familiar, the invasion stripes were added to the airplanes for the um, invasion of uh, Normandy, D-Day, 1944, June 6th. Uh, and that was so the aircraft could be instantly identifiable uh, on the ground uh, to Allied forces as Allied aircraft. After the invasion and once the uh, Allies had a foothold and the armed forces had a foothold in Europe, um, for the most part, the upper stripes were eliminated and only the lower stripes were retained. And that was just, again, just to prevent a friendly ground fire from downing a friendly aircraft. Okay, so anyway, invasion stripes 101. Um, I like the look of them better just on the underside. I don't like the wrap around over the tops of the wings and over the fuselage. That's just me. Everybody models these uh, aircraft from that period a little bit differently, I think. Um, again, after that period of the war, most of the camouflage painting on the upper surfaces was just eliminated. There's no need for it. Uh, Allies had air superiority and didn't need to worry about so much about death from above. They only needed to really be concerned about ground fire. Uh, enemy aircraft uh, activity was you know, minimal to non-existent by the time they were uh, flying these with the clean uh, aluminum finishes. Right, so there's all of that for you. Um, I'm not sure what else I need to say at this point. I just wanted to kind of go over the landing gear and show you the little pieces and parts of the details that I was trying to capture the best I could um, and still have functioning retractable gear. Uh, I'm hoping at the end of this uh, exercise that's what this, uh, that's what this project will convey. Um, you know, that hey, yeah, that guy tried to do something. You know, I mean, how how successful I was is up to you, but uh, that's all. That's what we're trying to do. And um, again, it's just been a long haul on the wing, um, and I still have to get back to the fuselage. We, you know, I still need to work on the cockpit details, and I still need to obviously finish the uh, tail surfaces, and I still need to continue prepping this with uh, filler and uh, sealer to get it ready for paint. So there's lots of work yet to do, but if you've forgotten what the fuselage looks like or the cockpit here, uh, let me see how much, I don't know how much light I have, but 
Again, the canopy is not fixed. Uh, the canopy bow here at the back is not finished. I just wanted to get a kind of a mock-up in there to see what I was going to be doing with that. Um, you know, the engine detail, the scoop, and all that stuff that I added. Um, there's the uh, exhaust and the, um, the bypass for the turbine or the turbocharger. Um, let's see, and here's at the back. This is the exhaust of the actual turbo turbocharger. Um, exhaust and then again on the sides the side vents for that massive turbocharger on this the same one i think that was attached to the um b17s and uh and b24 engines um if i'm not mistaken you know, don't quote me but uh it had a massive uh, turbocharger in the lower fuselage there that gave this airplane its high altitude performance allowed it to escort uh Allied bombers uh, deep into Germany. Now, the aircraft could carry enough fuel to do it, um, but it was maligned early in the war by uh, what they called the bomber mafia, the generals in charge of our uh, daylight bombing campaign. U.S. daylight bombing campaign, uh, which those earlier uh, generals uh, wanted to, and I think it was LeMay was leading that, figured that they could just run daylight bombing with no escort because the B-17 was just vastly superior. These were these were guys that came up through Bomber Command and ended up uh, running the air war, and they up until 19 mid 1943, I think it was. So they scapegoated the P-47. Um, you know, when they got caught with their pants down, we lost a a, a whole lot of uh, Eighth Air Force bombers, P-17s and P-24s. In one day, I think there was a couple, a couple of days, uh, one raid um, in particular, and those guys were discharged, and the U uh, U.S. Army Air Corps, um, they essentially scapegoated the P-47, said it never had the range to do that job, and they didn't have a fighter for it, and, you know, until the, the P-51 P came along, we didn't have a deep, uh, ra a long-range escort fighter. It just wasn't true. The P-47 could carry multiple fuel tanks. Um, you know, they could they could reach deep into Germany and dogfight. It was it was malarkey, as somebody likes to say. Uh, it wasn't true. But anyway, that's that's what happened. The P-47 went on to be a tremendous uh, ground uh, ground attack aircraft. Uh, was rel basically relegated to that role when the P-51s and eventually the P-38 Lightning came on, came online for long-range escort. All right, so there's your air war history. Uh, P-47. Uh, one of my favorite airplanes for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it was robust. It could take all kinds of punishment. I think, again, it was the only fighter aircraft the U.S. supplied um, to the war, in fact that any country supplied to the war, where every single ace, that means anybody who could fly the airplane and survive air combat, survived the war. And uh, so, so the airplane didn't fail anybody who could fly it. Um, you know, often making it back to base with up to half of its engine cil cylinder shot away, half of the uh, control services shot away, just bullet holes. But because of the armor plating that they had, because of the supercharger in the fuselage protecting it from uh, <clears throat> gunfire from below, and for a lot of other reasons, it was just a tremendous airplane. So, uh, like the Wildcat, too, the P-47 was in the war from the very beginning to the very end in one iteration or another, so uh, one of my favorite planes, along with the Wildcat, uh, kind of the unsung heroes. I, I also happen to like um, Hurricanes, uh, Hawker Hurricanes, just a little bit more than I like the Spitfire. We'll get some flack for that, but I don't care. That's, you know, to my mind, they were, it, it just accomplished uh, a lot more given what it was, and, and that's what I'm talking about with P-47 and Wildcat, given what they were, uh, and when they came, you know, into the fight right from the start, you know, they were still capable airplanes, so anyway, that's, that's enough of that. 
right so the landing gear coming along lots more to do and i'll get back to you all later thanks for watching the channel really appreciate that hope everybody's having a great day